How wonderful to think that those words are already fulfilled in our Saviour that we just sung there in verse 10. Well, let's uh, turn to read in the Scriptures. And we're reading from Ecclesiastes, uh, page 667 in the um, Church Bible. Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 1, and then we have two short readings from the New Testament. So page 667, Ecclesiastes, 1 Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and we begin the first chapter at the first verse. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes. But the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes round to the north. Round and round goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there's nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things. Yet to be among those who come after. And then we turn uh, to 2 Corinthians and chapter 5. So you'll find it on page 1163. Page 1163, 2 Corinthians 5 beginning at the 11th verse and reading to the end of the chapter. Uh, the preacher asked, is there anything new? Well, that's what we're going to find the answer to as we read uh, in wider scripture and the full revelation of God. Verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord... We persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known to your conscience also. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves... It is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we, we, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. 
the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then we turn to Revelation chapter 21. And you'll find that on page 1250. Revelation 21. And there's going to be a greater renewal. This moment in time, uh, God's uh, new work is happening in individuals. It's happening uh, like the wind blowing. Um, and uh, often uh, our people can't see what God is doing. But there is a day when the whole world, the whole human race ever to have lived will see uh, what God is doing and the new thing that he's doing. John chapter 21 and verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, as a description of the church. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Amen. Well, let's turn in our Bibles then to the passage in Ecclesiastes, um, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 1. And uh, we want to look tonight together at these uh, first 11 verses of this uh, chapter. Uh, you will find it on page 668 in the Church Bible. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to uh, follow along then with um, our, uh, the message uh, this evening. This section of scripture is named after its central figure, the teacher or the preacher, the lecturer. It's a title that the author the human author uses to describe himself six times. He's a bit like a university lecturer, or we might say a newspaper columnist, or perhaps for those who are tech savvy, the blogger. Reflecting on life and commenting on life itself. We tend to think that's a very 21st century thing to do, but it's not. Because this individual lived 3,000 years ago. And he set out to explore, not on his own behalf, because he already knew the answer, but on behalf of others, what is the point of life? And how thankful we should be that we have a book like this in Scripture. Because that is a question that is asked 
in every generation, and in some generations, it is more pertinent than others. And in our generation, when there seems to be so much hopelessness and so much confusion and futility in people's thinking, the question is, needs to be asked, what is the point of life? And you and I, as Christ's people, and the Church of Christ have to be able to answer that question in a way that engages people in their minds and hearts and then their wills. What is the point of life? Is it not um, the inability to answer that question that has led to the increasing of number of suicides? in our land? Well, what's the point? I can't keep going on. So I'll just end it all. And perhaps you've asked that question or someone has asked it of you. What is life about? It's a brilliant question. And it takes us to the heart of human existence. And the starting point of our writer is the perspective that he meets all around him. Verse 2, vanity or meaningless, depending which translation you're using. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. All is meaningless. Life is utterly pointless. So what evidence does the columnist, the blogger, the lecturer, the preacher um, give in support of that conclusion? How do people come to that point of saying it's utterly meaningless? Because that's what that phrase, vanity of vanities, means. Utterly meaningless. It's like us saying, whiter than white. Whiter than white. You've come across that phrase. Well, vanity of vanities means utterly pointless. So, how do people reach that conclusion that everything is meaningless? And in verses 4 to 11, his life, his evidence is drawn from what he observes in life. He looks at life around him and he um, studies life intensely. And he says, I see an endless cycle. Cycle. Life is a kind of merry-go-round. You get on, you go round and round and round for a while, and then you fall off. Like a merry-go-round, the children ride on a fairground, but with a very tragic and uh, difference. Children want to get in the merry-go-round for pleasure and fun. And this lecturer does not find much fun in the merry ground of human life that is pointless. So what does he consider well? And what brings him to say this is the common perception? Life is utterly meaningless. Well, he considers, first of all, the activity of human beings. The things that we do that mark life. They suggest if you simply pursue those and nothing more and you see that is all that life is, well then it's meaningless. Verse 3, what does man gain? It's a word from the world of business. What does man gain? What does man profit from all his labour at which he toils under the sun? Well, Jesus anticipated that a man could get the whole world, not literally, but he could gain all he wanted. But you see, if there's nothing to life beyond that, what we can see, the here and now, what we can touch, what is the point of the merry-go-round of human activity? What's the point of getting up and showering, eating breakfast, going to work? Coming home, maybe 
doing some exercise or relaxing and sleeping, well, to do it all over again. Tomorrow and the next day and the next day and seven days in the week, 365 days in the year. He says, because we come and go in our successive generations, but few of us achieve anything of lasting or world significance. And even then, that doesn't uh, give point or meaning to life. Of the few who hit first place in world recognition, how many are known beyond their day? Go back 3,000 years ago. Of the millions of people alive then, how many have you heard of? How many have I heard of? Well, we've heard of Solomon. And maybe you've heard of Ramesses II of Egypt, who was the pharaoh of Egypt at that time. And the, law, the lecturer draws his own collusion, uh, sorry, conclusion, not collusion, conclusion, verse 4. One generation passes away, falls off the roundabout, this pointless roundabout, and another generation gets on, like children waiting at the fairground. Come closer to home, to your family. Um, whom have you heard about beyond your grandparents? I don't know anything really about my family beyond my grandparents. And this lack of lasting significance leads the lecture to conclude verse 11. There's no remembrance of former either people or achievements, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. Now he's not saying here that there's no individual, but he's saying here's the general rule of thumb. For every one person that's remembered that has made their mark, and Isaac Newton or Louis Pasteur or whoever that you want to mention, there's a million or millions who haven't. And so he considers the activity of human beings, and he says, vanity. All is vanity. But then secondly, he considers the activity of nature. So he looks now not at those who are in the world, but what is there and sees the generations come and go. He looks at, as it were, almost, you want to call it the horses that are in the merry-go-round. Verses 5 to 8. And he justifies his conclusion utterly meaningless from his observation of the natural world around him. Verse 5. He says, look at the sun. Verse 6. Look at the wind. Verse 7. Look at the waters. And what do you see? Well, he says, the world, the, sorry, the wind swirls around. And the waters swirl around. And the, the word there is designed to bring out just a pointless, monotonous side of the activity. It's a bit like when you pull the plug in your sink and the water just gurgles down and you see this swirling effect. And he says, the wind comes, the wind goes, it follows the same course. The sun rises and it sets and it hastens then to come back around tomorrow. So to him it just seems that life is an endless cycle, an endless merry-go-round. To what purpose or to whose benefit does the wind and the waters and the sun do these things? Nature itself, he says, is caught up in this kind of merry-go-round. And this leads the uh, columnist or the blogger to observe, verse 8, all things are wearisome. More than one can say. Um, they're full of labor. They're just an endless cycle of activity. Everybody's rushing and everything's rushing on, but not going anywhere. Not achieving anything new. Um, or discovering 
anything that brings purpose. And look at what he says then. He says, and it's, it's, it's hard to express this. He says, but it's summed up in this. He said, the human eye, it can never see enough. That's true, isn't it? With people in our neighborhoods, maybe, and every vehicle that goes up the road, every person that walks past the house, they could tell you the moment, the time, what they were wearing and what they were driving. They can't see enough. And there's people and the ear can't hear enough. They've got to hear the latest bit of juicy news or gossip about people in their community and they've got to be the first to tell it. And it just keeps going on and on and on. You're wondering now why you came to church tonight. By this stage. But there is. He's going to get to a better place. You see, we're always looking for something new. Something more. And we think if we had this, if we do this, or if we were that, um, we would have found life in its meaning. We would be made as the saying is. Or at least that's a Fermanagh phrase. You'd be made. We're restless. We're as restless as the wind and the sun and the waters. But the more we look or listen for meaning to life within ourselves or nature, the more disappointed we become, the more dissatisfied, and ultimately the more disillusioned we come. Money, nature, music, friendship, relationship, success, they don't ultimately fill that void that is in every human heart. And that brings the writer then in the third place uh, to um, consider the activity of history. Because now he says in 9 uh, and in part of verse 10 as well, and we touched on it there in verse 11, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. So ultimately, when you look at the big picture of life, it's not about the discovery of penicillin. It's not about the discovery and the arrival of the digital age. The round of life is the history of people. People are born. They go to school of one kind or another. They... Uh, find something to do with their lives. They um, come across brokenness in their lives and brokenness comes into their lives and they experience pain and sorrow. And he's saying, this is true throughout history. And nothing, he says, for 3,000 years or more has changed that. And so, um, the, as he, he considers the activity of history, he says it is all meaningless or vanity. Vanity of vanities. Verse 11, there's no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come, but those by those who will come after. When you and I are dead and gone, of outside of our families, 50 years later, there'll be nobody, practically, or probably, who will say, do you remember Harry Coulter? Do you remember William Armstrong? Do you remember Tony Elliott? It's not gonna happen, folks. That's the lesson of history. And he says, well, what's the point then? What's the point? And so that brings him in the fourth place. And there's a little glimmer of light here. He, the, and, and 
The columnist or the preacher or the blogger, he does this again and again. He just throws in a little glimmer of light. And he's hoping that people will grasp that and pursue it. And you see, that's often what we should be about in our witness. It's not about that when we're witnessing to people, you've got to spend an hour talking to them. And you think that by the end of the hour, they're going to be converted. Typically, that does not happen. But typically it is just one little line that the Lord, if the Lord would give us one phrase, one sentence that the person will take away and they'll turn over. The Holy Spirit will cause them to turn it over in their minds. Is that not what happened to many of us? And so where's the little nugget of hope? Well, it's found in verse 10. Because here now um, he considers the possibility of something new. Is there anything new of which it may be said, see, this is new? He's done all this study and he, he, he's reached this general conclusion, but he says we still have to allow for the possibility that there's something I've missed, that there's something that society has missed, that is new, and that does bring purpose and hope and direction to life. And we want to answer that question because there is something new. There is something new. And Um, the Bible answers the question, yes. And the Old Testament says yes. But as we were saying this morning, in the Old Testament era, it was more difficult for Joe Bloggs to discover what is new. But now in the New Testament... It's not difficult for anyone to discover what is new because the reality is there was an individual who came into the history of humanity. It's recorded, not only in Scripture, but also in the history books. There was one born around 5, 3 BC. We can't be sure of the exact year born to a virgin, and this was new. A child had never been born to a virgin before, where no man was involved. That was new. But then the whole unfolding of that individual's life was new, because here now there was someone who was marked not by vanity and hopelessness, but whose whole life was built on hope and new hope and radiated hope and then went on to preach hope and went on to die to secure hope and knew something new for all of us. That one, of course, is Jesus Christ. And it is Jesus Christ who is speaking here in Revelation 21 verse 5 when he says, Behold! And you see, he's saying stop and think about it because you're not going to see this anywhere else or any other time or in any other individual. Behold, I make all things new. And when we read the New Testament we realize that there's a new covenant. God's a new way of dealing with human sin and it's not in the blood of animals, it's in the blood of this one Jesus of Nazareth. We're told there is new life, that the thirst and that desire that that the uh, um, preacher is talking about, that people are not able to get satisfied as he observes them in his society, That is satisfied by Christ. He's the living water that 
is like living water that uh, wells up, enters into us, and wells up and brings um, uh, life so that we never thirst uh, for that fullness again. We never hunger because we have it. We have it. We don't have to look for it anywhere else. And this Christ, when he gives me and you that new life in and through himself by his Holy Spirit and brings us to repent and believe, what does he say about us? Well, he says, believe it or not, you're a new creation. You're not your old self. You're a new person. And all things have passed away. And I'm in the process, Christ says, of making everything new. And there's a new commandment. The commandment is now. And there's a new desire that this commandment um, brings to a fore and brings to the forefront, which is to love the Lord your God with all that you have and to love your neighbor as yourself. And you have a new hope. And the new hope is when I die, it's not the end. In fact, death is the beginning. And death takes me into something better and greater. Because now I'm going to see God in Christ. And he's going to wipe away the tears. And all the heartaches that have built up over the years of my life, he's going to take them all away. And indeed, in the future, he's going to give me a new body. The old body will go into the grave, but at a point, my old body, when Christ comes again, will rise out of the grave and be joined to that perfect soul that is in heaven, coming with Christ, and I'll have a new body. Be a new, there in the newness will be complete. And do you know what we'll do? We'll have a new song. And our whole singing, there's going to be nothing about self then. Um, whether it's a literal new song or not, but the, what it's saying is there's going, to be a new, there's going to be a completely and entirely um, um, new focus in a way in which has never been before. Even when we were Christians on the earth, there's only one we'll want to think of. There's only one we'll want to serve. There's only one we'll want to worship. And that is Christ. And we will do that in the new heavens and the new earth where there's no longer this same round of activity that seems pointless and hopeless and futile, but we will live there and we will enjoy God. And we will enjoy his world forever and ever and ever. So is there anything new? The preacher was right to leave a little chink in the door. And into that chink, Christ has come and he's pushed the door wide open. And he says to me, he says to us tonight, he says to those who will listen later, your life is vanity without Christ. And your life, life is utterly meaningless and you will not find satisfaction until you find your delight in him who makes you new from the inside out. Giving you a new heart. A heart that loves him. Giving you a life that where your sin is paid and cancelled uh, and you have his righteousness. And he's the focus, increasingly, albeit not perfectly, of your life. Yes, um, is there anything new of which you, you can say, look, this is something new? Jesus Christ says, look, I make all things new. I make individuals new. And I will make this whole world new. And so the little nugget that we want to drop in everybody's mind that hears this message is 
Christ. Christ. Seek him. To know him. To know who he was. And what he's done. And in him you will find life. Amen.